Hi there, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Earthing Live. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Be sure to have your questions ready as we will be speaking with Clint Ober. Thank you for joining us. Just sit tight and we'll get started here in just a minute. Have your questions ready as we'll be speaking with Clint Ober. Hi everyone and welcome to Earthing Live where we answer your questions about earthing and grounding. We meet weekly on Mondays at 3.30 Pacific time. Just a real quick reminder before we get started, uh, anything we talk about here is not meant to replace the advice of your doctor or healthcare practitioner. Please always consult with your healthcare provider before making any adjustments to your medication or recommended health routine. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Clint Ober. Jennifer. Uh, yes, I see uh, we have people here joining us on Zoom, uh, YouTube, Facebook. Just so you know, real quick on how to submit your questions, you can submit them in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar. So if you are joining us on Zoom, make sure that you click on that Q&A section. If you try to hit the chat um, section, I don't always see that, but I do have the Q&A window open all the time. If you're on Facebook or YouTube, just go ahead and submit your questions in the comments portion. As always, my customer service team is in the background helping me out and they will make sure I see all of those questions. If you have any general customer service questions, such as how to track an order, how to place an order, you can go ahead and um, contact us at help at earthing.com. Or you can just visit earthing.com and get our phone numbers. You can live chat us. There's a lot of ways to get a hold of us there. So now, welcome, Clint. How are you? I'm pretty good. Trying to adjust to uh, daylight savings time, but I'm doing pretty good so far. Yeah, I feel like this one's a little bit easier because we gain an hour. I feel like the yes. spring one's a little harder, but right. it is still an adjustment. Yeah, it is. Um, well, for those of you who are new and joining us for the first time, uh, Clint Ober is our founder over here at Earthing. He um, has been working for the past 25 years to not only spread the knowledge of Earthing, but also gain more knowledge with studies and um, trying to develop products. So uh, he's definitely probably the, the leading expert on Earthing and, and all of that. So we will get started here. All right. Okay, 
So the first question um, says, in previous web webinars, you seem to imply that static electricity is bad for us because it imparts a positive charge on the body. However, my understanding is that in many cases, like when we rub our feet against the rug, we can actually pick up electrons making ourselves more negative. Why isn't that static, that negative static charge good for us if the idea is the body needs more electrons? Why can't this be a good alternative way to get electrons when we need them? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I would say that 99% of the time when you are um, create, generating static electricity, the static electricity is uh, really tribal charging. Uh, all you're doing is just pick your foot up off the floor. Every time you have contact and separation, then some of the electrons are left somebody's giving up electrons and somebody's gaining or losing electrons. Uh, generally speaking, it will be that you are giving up electrons and you have a shortage of electron in your body. Uh, and so that means that electrons are, when you touch a doorknob or whatever, there'll be a spark. The spark oftentimes is coming from the doorknob to you because the doorknob has an excess of electrons because it's more equal with the environment. Uh, and you'll feel it if it's like, three to 5,000 volts, you'll see it and feel it. If it's below that, very seldom will you, ever, will you ever feel it. But you are, every time you walk on a carpet, pick a foot, I mean a, a rubber sole shoe or a synthetic sole shoe up off of the carpet and go to the next one, go to the next one. Every time you do that, you are creating static charge on your body. And as you go on, that static charge will forever, um, dissipate, slowly dissipate from the body just into the atmosphere, depending on the amount of humidity that's there. I mean, it'll be grabbing electrons out of the, you know, the negative ions that are floating in the air. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a challenge to explain. Uh, the, when I made those statements, basically it means that today we live, our, we live in a sea of static electricity. You walk into your home and you, if you don't take your shoes off, then when you walk into your home, then the shoes and carpets or artificial flooring type, even those wood, plastic wood planks and all those things, that's all plastic. So you are creating uh, static electricity every time you take a step. Take your shoes off and walk barefoot, then it won't create any static electricity on your body because <clears throat> uh, your body's conductive and it'll equalize with you know, whatever the floor is or whatever. Um, the other thing is you sit down on the couch and you get up, your clothing and the fabric on the uh, couch is going to create static electricity. The foam in the side of the couches are going to make static electricity. The, when you go to bed, you pull up your covers, you're going to create static charge. Sometimes if you turn all the lights up and just pick your sheet up like this, you look inside and there's a lightning storm in there. Um, <clears throat> and that's, you, you know, when you're not grounded. Um, so, uh, it's really, this is an abnormal situation in nature. You would never have static electricity on your body. It's not possible. Um, <clears throat> so today we live in the sea of static electricity. There is no information out there in the current literature that speaks to uh, static electricity being harmful to a human being. Um, but there's a billion dollar industry, billions of dollar industry that grounds employees um, that work on software, chips, factories, clean rooms, uh, electrical, dynamite, uh, gasoline, all those industries, the employees have to be grounded in order to prevent a spark that might cause a fire or an explosion. Uh, so it's kind of like, we didn't know that not being grounded had an impact on our health until we started doing all these studies 20 some years ago. And now we know. We could go back and do the same st things with static electricity, but it's kind of an odd thing because when you ground somebody, there's no static electricity on the body. So we kind of, the studies are the same. You wanna make them relevant to static, then you would have to have measured the amount of static on the body at that time. We didn't do that because <clears throat> what we assumed, we didn't wanna make our studies about 
in the early days, everybody wanted to make them because EMF, because you can take a meter and say, oh my goodness, look here, here's a meter, look, see, and when you get grounded, the meter goes down. Well, of course it goes down. Um, but what grounding is about, it's not about static charge in your body. It's not about EMF or anything like that. It's really about your body having a shortage of free electrons in your body to uh, reduce reactive oxygen species that are produced by your immune system. Uh, throughout all time, throughout all evolution, throughout all time, we were barefoot, sleeping in caves, wherever, but we never had to worry about grounding because we were always naturally grounding. As, as progress came along, and especially in the last 100 years, 200 years, uh, we've moved indoors, um, and then we started, as soon as we created plastics in the 60s, then we plasticized our floors, our shoes, our furniture, our beds, now it's really takes a big effort to even touch the earth where before you couldn't get ungrounded. Now you can't get grounded. So the, the benefit of grounding or the purpose of grounding, the only reason you wouldn't ground yourself is to gain electrons to maintain the, uh, the electrical stability of the body so that the immune system can, uh, so you can put out the inflammatory markers or the uh, reduce the radicals in your body so your immune system can go back to normal rather than sitting there trying to fight this low-grade burning fire called inflammation in your body. And everybody who lives ungrounded has inflammation in their body. So, <clears throat> but anyhow, that's what it's really about. So can you gain enough electrons from, um, you know, putting your foot up and down and creating a lot of static electricity? No, I don't think, I think that's probably not going to happen. Uh, but 99% of the time, it'll be a positive, I mean, a negative charge, a positive charge on your body. So you need to absorb electrons to reduce that, that charge. So you either need to gain them. I mean, it could be either, but, but you, need them to, you need to gain them either through electrons migrating, uh, you know, migrating. I mean, there, there, there's electrons in the air, there's air ions, there's all these other components. But anyhow, if there's a charge here, then anytime there's a negative charge or a negative ion or a negative air ion or something, they're all going to kind of eventually migrate and slowly reduce this stuff. The problem is we live in an environment where we're creating, constantly generating them. And the immune system is operating 24-7. It doesn't go on, on to work at 9 o'clock at night. I mean, you can get off the clock at 6. Every time you take a breath, every time you eat something, every time you exercise, whatever, you're creating inflammation in your body. So I hope I answered that. Yes. And on those lines, uh, here's another question um, about using a multimeter to confirm that you're indeed grounded. Uh, we do sell an instrument, we call it the product tester to test grounding, but it really only tests the products and not the people. What is a reliable way to use a multimeter to prove that you are grounded? I was told that we look for a change in electric potential of greater than 90%. Is that correct? Well, normally, if you're grounded with a um, if you're grounded with a cord that has a hundred k resistor in it, you will be um, probably ninety five percent even more uh, change in potential. But what you, in order to really truly use a multimeter to test all of this to Earth, if you really want to know that you're grounded to Earth, then you have to go outdoors and find your ground rod that's servicing your home, especially the ones coming into the mains. <clears throat> then you have to drive a secondary ground rod within a couple inches of it. Then you connect a wire to that ground rod and run it in the house, up the stairs, wherever, through a window, bring it in and connect it to the ground side of your voltmeter. Then you take your positive um, side of the voltmeter, the red probe, um, you can put a, you know, and, and so that's when you touch it with your fingers, that's going to tell you if you have an E field charge, uh, it won't 60 Hertz, it'll, it'll tell you 60 Hertz. Um, if you have a scope, then you can go down and see, you know, the, um, DC and all that kind of stuff. But, um, <clears throat> so, you know, you touch the red probe. 
So you can either take that red probe and connect it to your earth ground in your outlet, just stick it in the, you shouldn't be doing any of this if you're not an electrician, but stick it in the uh, little round port that's ground. And that'll tell you the ohms of resistance between the two. There should be, it should be relatively zero. I mean, it should be in the um, few, um, you know, 100 ohms or less or 50 ohms or 10 ohms or uh, really it should be around 10 ohms. Um, so that means that your electrical ground is clean and it is going to be your, you know, but if you take your ground rod and you stick it 50 feet away or 20 feet or 10 feet away from the earthing ground rod, then when you measure them, you're not measuring um, the resistance on the line, you're measuring the resistance between 50 feet of earth. Earth is not a conductive wire, an electrical wire. It'll have, there'll be a difference in electrical potential uh, in like 60 Hertz electrical potential. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and so if you bring the ground rods closer together, it'll be less. If you take them further apart, it'll be more. Uh, and that's where so many people at the EMF get all confused because they're trying to measure this and measure that and they don't realize you know the, the what you had the principles of how you're going to take a measurement. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, so what I would, if you put a mattress cover on your mattress, run the wire the way I said in the house via the ground outdoors close to the electric meter or the uh, ground rod, and then when you put the red test portion on the Matt, it should read similar to, uh, it'll have read 100 ohms because you have, I mean, 100, 100 K ohms because we have 100 K ohms resistor in the line to prevent any kind of um, an electrical event. To measure the body, all you got to do is lay down on the, measure your body before you lay down on the mat, which you just take your fingers and hold the red probe and you'll measure whatever EMF are in the environment. That's all you can measure. <laughs> Uh, is because uh, you can't even measure static electricity that way. But anyhow, so you'll measure EMF. Then when you lay down on the bed pad, uh, if you're if you have a lot of skin contact, it'll be back to near 100 ohms. Um, if you have lots of clothing sheets on, it'll be something different. But if the, the difference will be when you measure your body before you lay down and measure your body after you lay down. But remember that what you're measuring you're touching the probe of the meter with your skin and your skin also has resistance. Like <clears throat> the, re the resistance on your arm may be five megs, five meg ohms. On your fingers, it may be 200 K. Um, on the bottom of your foot, it may be a hundred K. So, but there's no consistent, the body's not an electrical wire. So you're never going to find a consistent part of the body where everything, unless you use electrode patches. So stick an electrode patch on the palm of your hand, take an alligator clip and clip the electric meter to that, take an alligator clip and, and do the same thing or touch the bed pad. There's different ways to do this. You, your language that you spoke, you asked the question, and you have some working knowledge of electrical, but I'm just trying to throw out so that other people grasp what we're talking about here. All right. Next question, is it possible to experience itching while using earthing mats? It wouldn't be an allergy from the mat. We have, there are conditions that are related to itching. Um, but no, the, the composition of the, of the mat, the carbon and so on. I don't, I don't think that would cause an itching or an allergy. Uh, itching is, there's mineral ramification. There's all kinds of, if you go to Google and look up itching, you may be able to find more information that might be related, but always remember that when you're grounded, what you're doing is you're reducing inflammation and then you have healing that goes on. Once you put the fire out, then the immune system can go back to work and start repairing and restoring the body, returning the body to normal. In that process, in the healing process, it's like when you have, you know, a scab or something, there's itching and stuff that you want to scratch it off. 
So I'm not sure how to answer this for sure without any more knowledge, but I would go to Google, check all of that out and then determine whether or not it's a healing uh, response from the inflammation being put out or if it's an old wound healing or recovering or those kind of things. Let us know, we don't know. <laughs> Yeah, we don't normally hear about itching. I think we've heard of it one other time, and that was a person who reached out during the webinar asking, but our we checked with our customer service team and they'd not heard of that before. So no. um, anything's possible though. No. Yeah. Okay, my next question. Do the universal mats lose their grounding strength even if you take good care of them? How many years should they last? How would you know if it's not working fully? Or how would you measure their decreased effectiveness? Okay. <clears throat> if, you, if you take an earthing mat and you use it just as a regular mat, the only thing that will, there's a couple things that can, uh, you know, impede or affect the conductivity. One is if you put patchouli oil on it and all these, uh, you know, those funny oils that a lot of people put on to cleanse them. It's not a good idea because they are oil-based and they have acid in them. And it doesn't really hurt the conductivity, but it, it um, creates a barrier, an oil barrier. The other thing will be uh, if you, like if you use a, uh, a you know, mat for years and for a mouse pad and you have your hands on it, sometimes you'll build up a little bit of oil, but it would take years to do that. But generally, there's not much that can impact. You have to remember this is the, the polyurethane, the, the uh, unimats are made of polyurethane and carbon. Carbon will last forever and polyurethane will last for 200 years. So it can't, you know, I mean, it's recyclable and all of that kind of stuff, but uh, so it's not gonna just go bad. You have to oxidize the urethane, which is really impossible. Uh, or you have to, or it's just a layer of, you need to clean them, just clean them, just clean them with, you know, simple soap and water. Mm -hmm. Just wipe them down, keep them clean, and they should last forever. Uh, the only reason they wouldn't is because there's been a destructive, uh, um, a chemical of some kind that can impact urethane, which is almost unheard of. That's why urethane is such a, a widely used product because it's hardy and it's impermeable and it's inert once you cure it. Also want to wipe it down for any oils that may have built up on the product. That's another reason we see. Yeah, just the oils. Yeah. Okay, uh, jumping over to YouTube. Uh, can you use the patch on the thyroid area to help with these issues? Or can you place on any other, over any other organ? You can put the patch anywhere. Uh, I wouldn't put it on top of an open wound, but you can put it near an open, you know, or wound um, or recovery or you know, whatever from any event because it keeps the inflammation down. <clears throat> the patches are really, uh, we don't know how to explain everything that goes on with the patches, but uh, if you have indigestion, you can put a patch on top of your tummy and it'll reduce indigestion. How does it do that? It doesn't really make a lot of sense, but it does uh, because uh, it just doesn't make sense except for that <clears throat> when you have pain or heat or charge in the body and over here you have elect negative electrons, here you have positive electrons, there's a force here that is going to pull them together. And a lot of them, these electrons can migrate through and, you know, through tissue um, and reduce charge. Um, but you can put them on anywhere you want to. Thyroid, you want, one of the number one things that we hear over the years is people who start sleeping grounded, uh, they have a reduction, they have a change in thyroid uh, in T3 or very whatever, but they, I mean, they're on the thyroid meds and sometimes they have to slowly come down because they get the heart population, heart palpitations, which everybody's kind of familiar with if they're on thyroid meds. Um, <clears throat> it's like you can't go out and eat a lot of spinach 
if you're on thyroid meds or any other thing. Um, so you can put them anywhere you want, anywhere you feel comfortable. Uh, if you're elderly, I would not put them on thin skin, but anyone else, you can put them wherever you want and your body will talk to you. You just listen to your body. You put a patch down and pain comes down. Hey, that's good. And usually you can take it off and it goes away. All right. Speaking of, of patches, um, this person's question, I have been using two patches on the hand, one on the hand and one on the shoulder for my dislocated shoulder and muscle tears. I'm having a flare of huge swelling and bursitis. Do you have any other recommendations? I also use the uni mat, one on my pillow, one under my knees and one under my feet. Okay. Um, the bursitis is, is is this in the area of the shoulder? I mean, looks like a dislocated shoulder. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would get some medical attention and see if there's a tear adjustment or whatever's really going on there. But <clears throat> once all of that's under control, if you, if you were to need you know, some stitching for muscle tears or so on, once all of that's under control, the patches on the shoulder and the palm of the hand should resolve that situation. That's what we hear all the time um, <clears throat> and recovery. But to have continued uh, adverse pain flaring and all that kind of stuff, I would suggest there might be something you're doing during the day that might be contributing to this. Um, because you really do have to, when, you're, when your body's in pain, uh, that means you have inflammation going on in the body. That means the body's healing. Um, <clears throat> the inflammatory inflammation that goes on after the healing, that kind of interferes with the healing process and lengthens it. But, <clears throat> um, but the point is the pain indicates there's inflammation. Inflammation indicates there's a problem and you need to um, put, you know, um, reduce the inflammation. It's a message from the body to stop doing something that's causing this inflammation. You know, during the day, if, if you're recovering, uh, then you need to recover. You need to stop and make sure that as long as there's pain there, you're not taking Advil trying to get through something. You need to, nothing wrong with Advil. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you don't want to um, dampen the pain. You want to figure out what's going on bring about recovery, support recovery, support your immune system, reduce the inflammation, which I know that the patches, if you've got a good ground, the patches are reducing the inflammation, uh, especially while they're on. Uh, after that, if you have to spend as much time grounded or more time grounded than you're not grounded during the healing process to really recover fully quickly. Okay, next question. Silver coated fabric is a better conductor than copper. It is often used in grounding socks. Therefore, wouldn't I get better treatment of an ankle, of an ankle injury by grounding and wearing an entire sock rather than using a patch or putting my feet on a grounding pad? Would well, it just I... simulate sticking my foot into the ocean water? Um, <clears throat> we sell the sock uh, because some people prefer the sock over the patches. Um, and the patches sometimes will come off at night. And um, it's definitely, to me, the patches one, the sock is two, um, the mat or whatever would be three. If you have acute pain, then I would use the patch and try to get recovery. I mean, try to expedite the recovery process. Then if it's a chronic thing because of your work or because of you have to wear shoes all day long or some of these things that might be exacerbating or preventing full recovery, then I would be put the fire out first and the patch is best for that. Uh, Long-term recovery, wear the socks at night. Um, put the socks on, Use a grounding, use a grounding mat that way you don't have to use the patches on the socks. I mean, or the 
virus on the socks. But the silver <clears throat> is not the issue. Um, the silver, I mean, the patch, what it does is it, <clears throat> because the, you have layers of dead skin throughout your whole body. So when you put a patch on, it breaks through the dead skin. So you have a, uh, you know, a, a great contact, perfect contact. And so electrons can go quickly and reduce the inflammation. If you put a sock on, it's the same thing. You still, you have to perspire quite a bit and get your, what your foot does and the hydrate the foot sufficient to get through the dead skin. But if it's an ankle, I would put the patch on. Play with it, do it all. <laughs> but use the patch to get the, um, to get it started and get it under control. The acute, the acute issue. Okay, uh, is there any example um, or of benefit from earthing for female fertility and menstrual cycle regulation? Well, we sure and we certainly hear a lot of it. <clears throat> I can tell you this: that one of the first things studies we ever did in Ventura, California, there was <clears throat> we we had like sixty subjects, and thirty of them were grounded, and thirty of them weren't, and <clears throat> we were. Uh, trying to um, take, you know, a, we were looking at pain and sleep. Uh, but what came out of that study was, you know, a lot of people had various issues, but one of them was a, a young lady who was probably in her, you know, early 20s, you know, late teens, early 20s. And <clears throat> during the month when her, during her cycle, she oftentimes wasn't able to work for a whole week at a time. I mean, she just couldn't work. I mean, she was just totally debilitated. But you know, when she was on the study, uh, she went she went to work, and she never had any issues whatsoever, any menstrual issues whatsoever during that period. And she said, "This is a miracle," you know, whatever, whatever. And but we've heard that many, many times. Uh, I've seen many times when we've been at events, people will be on their cycle, and we just put a patch on for a half hour. Or, have them sit grounded for a half hour or whatever. And it's just totally life-changing for them in just, just 30 minutes. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's, that's a big deal. And I don't really know how to explain all the results of it, but uh, the number one thing, and also we hear a lot of people going through menopause, they don't have the menopause, the, this normal symptoms that everybody reports, the ones who are grounded. Uh, interesting, a lot of the cultures, indigenous cultures that are grounded, also don't have uh, the menopause, hot flashes, the symptoms, and so on that go with that. What was the other part of that question? Uh, just uh, menstrual cycle regulation and female fertility. Yes. So, <clears throat> yes. And uh, our, the reason, all, I think the reason for all of these, so fertilization also, we had, when we first started grounding people up in uh, Ventura area and so on. We had <clears throat> one of the gentlemen who was involved with one of the studies, uh, his wife had not been able to get pregnant for many years and then all within 30 days of getting grounded, she got pregnant. Then we started hearing that from a couple of other people, uh, one or two that didn't really want to get pregnant, didn't think they could get pregnant and so on. And then that just automatically made me flash back to when I was a kid. Um, <clears throat> one of my uncles had Back then, it was people raised mink and sold them for money. And uh, so anyhow, we had a mink house. And when I would go over and visit my cousins, we'd be out there roughhousing around whatever. And, and one time, my uncle came out screaming at us. He says, get away from the mink house. Get away. You'll scare the mink, and they won't be able to conceive. And, <clears throat> and I made that connection. And then I went on to realize that uh, all animals, if they're if they're under any stress or if they have elevated cortisol, they can't conceive. So stress is your, I mean, cortisol is your fight or flight response. So if you are, if you have stress, you know, in your environment, your, you know, chronic, chronically elevated sympathetic state or chronically elevated stress, then it's going to be more, much more difficult to conceive because your body's flooded with cortisol and in nature, uh, Body, I mean, mammals don't uh, conceive unless they, there's safety, unless there's 
they feel safe unless there's, uh, but if they're stressed, they won't conceive. So anyhow, yes, I would say that uh, grounding is going to calm the nervous system. It's going to allow you to sleep better. It's going to reduce pain. You're going to be much more relaxed and much more likely to conceive. I know it's a big industry out there, but it's really as simple as getting grounded, I think. Okay. Um, Marilyn's question, I'm very new to earthing. I just found out about it recently and I'm wondering what I can do to help my ADHD four-year-old boy. Well, <clears throat> um, and again, I get myself in trouble all the time. Um, when I first got involved, uh, you know, back in you know, 20 some years ago, I remember I was up in, uh, again, the Ventura area and we were doing uh, some research and I ran into a um, person who was a therapist, a, a psychotherapist, I think, or whatever that was dealing with the, he was on the school board or whatever that dealt with the kids who had ADHD and AD, you know, the other ones. I mean, there's like two or three of them. And um, so I was, was visiting with them and um, I, I ran to go that, I better not go there. Anyhow, but the point is I made a comment off the wall. I said, these kids don't have ADHD. What they have is Nike-itis or, and again, I'm not picking on Nike, but they have tennis shoe-itis because they get up in the morning, they put their tennis shoes on. The last thing they do at night is take their tennis shoes off. And they even often sleep with their shoes on because they have a nice logo on them or something. And it's the most valuable thing. And that's their part of their, their whatever. But anyhow, so what I've found over the years is these kids are full of, uh, first of all, they're full of energy. They're full of, you know, they just have a lot of adrenaline. They have a lot of cortisol in their bodies just because they're active and they're doing what they do. And if they don't ground that out, then it, it, you know, their, their nervous system, their whole body just goes like this. It's like, we see it sometimes in the special needs classrooms, the, the kids, they just get wired up and they, and, and, and you know, the, the autism kids, autistic kids or the other kids, a lot of them, they, they will just totally melt down. <clears throat> but what we do or what we did in one classroom, we just had some yoga mats laying there on the floor. Eventually they found them. And then whenever they were getting ready to melt down, they would go over and actually lay down on these yoga mats. Uh, and, or otherwise they would want to go to the grounding room that we made up for them, which had bean bags and everything else that were all grounded. They would go in there and totally wired and, and whatever, like ADHD. And then they would, you know, calm down. The nervous system would calm down. Their cortisol would calm down. And then they would come back into class, but uh, my my I'm going to say that a lot of this is you need to take the shoes off the kids as much as possible. Get them outdoors uh, at least once in a while. Get the and I, and again I can I don't know I hate to use time and telling these stories, but but it's like, you know, I keep telling a story about the rabbits and the coyotes. And, and you know, and when I was a kid, the, you know, in the pasture, sometimes there was an infestation of, of rabbits. And at night, you could hold a flashlight out there or driving down the road in a car and you, the lights would shine off. And it was like, it looked like it was a water out there. That's how many there were. And that's because the year before it rained, we had a lot of grass. And then all of a sudden, the coyote explosion, I mean, a rabbit explosion. And then all of a sudden, there's a coyote. And the, but anyhow, so we're, the fun of that, we didn't have a lot of entertainment back then. We didn't have, we, we didn't have television back in some of those days. But anyhow, the, um, the, so watching coyotes chase rabbits was kind of an interesting phenomenon. But anyhow, so the rabbits would be sitting there eating grass like they normally do all day long. All of a sudden, the coyote starts to sneak up on them. Rabbit's ears goes up. The coyote springs. The rabbit springs into the air. And the rabbit runs back and forth across the pasture, zigzag, keeping one eye on the coyote. The coyotes were lumbering along, chasing him. <clears throat> Most all of the time, the coyote will drop in his tracks because he runs out of energy. The rabbit will go just a little bit further, but he's still so he can see the coyote. And then all of a sudden, you can see that he's shaking because he's just had his life threatened. And then all of a sudden, he lets go of this 
big visceral shake like that. And then he goes back to eating grass, like nothing ever happened. So <clears throat> what happened there was there was a shot of cortisol in the, from the fight or flight response that filled the rabbit full of adrenaline and full of cortisol. And he was able to run and save his life. But afterwards, I mean, he had all this energy stored up inside of his body. Now the rabbit, they ground it out. But our kids, they are, they are full of uh, stress and cortisol and adrenaline just because they interact with each other, because they play games. They have adrenaline running. They have, you know, I mean, it could be endless things, but they never ground this out. So if you could take, if you could do nothing more than take a kid outdoors for a half hour before he goes to bed and ground that out, drain that charge out of his body or her body, then they're going to sleep better. They're going to feel, they're going to recover better. And they're going to feel better. And I think it will help with the ADHD. Now that's free advice. That's from 20 years of observations. I'm not a doctor or a psychologist. I um, but I do have lots of experience with this and uh, it's really unfortunate. And you know, like the schools up in uh, the high desert where we were working up there, there's no place that there's no grass. There's only maybe 10 square feet of grass on the whole campus. Mm -hmm. These kids cannot get grounded. They, they store all of this up in there and then they have all these fluorescent lights that are uh, raining down on them during the day that kind of agitate the nervous system. So there's, this is, ADHD is an environmental health issue. You need to get these kids, you know, it's like the, the uh, echo therapy movement, the walk, you know, forest walking, all of these things. That's what that is all about. Reconnect with nature because there's a nature deficit in just feeling, but it's this feeling we're talking about, getting rid of grounding out all of this mm -hmm. lifestyle energy. I think that's a really good um, segue to this next question. Um, so the question is, do you know if earthing protects your energy from psychic attacks? I'm always told to shield my energy by grounding myself using visualization techniques. Wouldn't my grounding sheet do that? And I think this is an important question because it highlights in the meditation world and, and kind of that, you know, self uh, you know, that relaxation realm, they use the word grounding, but it's not necessarily an actual physical grounding to the earth. So maybe you can kind of explain the two between like mental grounding, as well as like physically grounding the body. Yeah, mentally grounding, I mean, physical grounding is touching the earth. The earth has a, a natural energy and we call it negative, we call it ground because it reduces and prevents charge. The earth also has resonant frequencies. They go, they, they, the amplitude increases and decreases depending on the time of day. Uh, so when you are grounded to the earth, then your, your, your body is negatively charged, maintains a negative charge, can't have inflammation when you're grounded. Animals in the wild don't have inflammation related health disorders, only human animals who live indoors with their owners. So, <clears throat> um, the, and then not only that, your, your, your body uh, is, you know, your hormone cascades, you know, at night you have several hormone cascades that are going on. Uh, you have rhythms and all kinds of things going on in your body, but these are all cued to the rhythms of the earth, the seasons and the seasonal rhythms of the earth. And when we're grounded, then our body, those frequencies are actually resonating in, uh, in us and we're, we're, we're projecting them, uh, radiating those earths. When you, it's like a tree, it radiates earth's energy. A human being, when it's grounded to the earth, radiates earth's energy. So that means it's charged with earth energy and it radiates it out and it pushes it. It's real, it's physical. <clears throat> so it's like when you are, uh, a lot of people have been playing with the EMF meters and measuring the uh, electric fields in the home. So when you're grounded, it's like we can put a mat on a bed and plug it in, measure the E field before, and then it'll reduce the, the electric field, you know, six feet away from the bed. 
And <clears throat> so that means that that pad, when it's on the bed, it's conducting Earth's energy and it's projecting it into the room. So it's creating a bubble. Okay, so <clears throat> that's physical grounding. Um, mental grounding is when you're trying to bring yourself in to ground your mind, quiet your mind, and get into a state. Ground your, you know, a grounded state, meaning uh, maybe spiritually connected to the earth, it may be mentally connected to the earth, but it's it's resonating with, again, it's trying to find space so that you can calm down or whatever. Um, <clears throat> one, they're one and the same, uh, except that physical grounding is providing more uh, to do with maintaining the negative charge on the body, the other grounding won't, um, and so on. So <clears throat> help me here, where did I go? I got myself sidetracked. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think you answered the question, the difference between your, a mental grounding and a physical grounding. Yeah. How um, physical grounding can help your mental health, but it's not the same as like a meditative state of mind, which is. Right. Now, you know, if you go back in, uh, you know, like Hercules or, um, you, know, you know, back in the old Greek times, you know, when I think it was, I forget who it was, uh, uh, it was held up by the heel. Um, as long as his strength was in being connected to the earth. And when he wasn't connected to the earth, he lost his strength. Okay, so this goes back to eons of time. Uh, people have known that, you know, our grounding there's a certain strength there, but it's really this energy that semi powers the body, but it also puts out this field of energy and protects you against other things like EMFs and so on. Mm -hmm. Any bad EMFs, people EMFs. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. In a previous webinar, you discussed how grounding to the chassis of a plane or a car provides some level of protection um, and even 90% of the protection of true grounding. When and how does a car or a plane chassis get grounded to the earth? Are the car tires conductive? What do you think of car grounding straps? Do they really provide additional help or is it negligible? Well, in the old days, when I was a kid, all the gasoline trucks and a lot of the automobiles had grounding straps, especially the pickups if they hauled any kind of um, explosive or chemicals or things. Um, <clears throat> so the grounding straps do work. They, they're not gonna work driving down the road there because they're gonna be flying and creating sparks and wearing down. But when you're driving around town and getting in and out of vehicles, you need to ground them rather than put a piece of metal up against it before you get out. <laughs> Um, so they do work, but not in the sense that a lot of people think maybe, um, <clears throat> but it's really to discharge the vehicle before you get out or uh, before anybody touches anything that could be explosive. Um, <clears throat> when, you, when you get in a car, the, the grounding, grounding is, first of all, when, you know, it's like pretend the car is, a, is the earth. Um, the car weighs 4,000 pounds and you weigh 200 pounds. Okay, so uh, is that 5%, something like that? So uh, on the other hand, the earth is infinitely large weight-wise, trillions and trillions of tons. And the human body is relatively very small, you know, a couple hundred pounds. So basically what happens is if there's a charge on the earth and you touch it, then based on the weight of the earth and based on the weight of yourself, it's gonna equalize. Well, because you're such infinitely small, you're gonna be 100% grounded to the earth. But in an automobile, you're gonna be 95% grounded because you, what you're gonna have, what happens in a car, the, first of all, all metal in a car is connected. It's also connected to the negative side of a battery. So there is a negative charge on all metal in a car. Uh, <clears throat> so when you connect to that metal via a seat pad or whatever, a ground, then <clears throat> your body is semiconductive. So it's going to absorb some of that probably. But the main thing that it does is when you're driving down the road in a car, the back of your seat is stationary. It stays in one spot. 
the bottom of your seat is going up and down, even though it's just micro movements, it's going up and down sufficient that there's a lot of tribal charging on your back and you're building up a lot of static electricity between your, your clothing and the back of the seat and that affects your whole body. So when you are grounded, because <clears throat> um, if you're not grounded, you're gonna get tribal charge, you're gonna charge up a static electricity and the like. But when you're grounded, then the static electricity that's being created on your back is being distributed throughout the entire automobile. So you're, it's going to be reduced automatically 95% just by weight distribution. Um, so that's a form of grounding. It's just grounding to the chassis is reducing the charge and spreading it over a larger ground, or, or in this case, a large metal ground. Um, <clears throat> the carbon in tires may, there may be some dis, um, dissipative or uh, assimilation of ground migrate. I mean, ground may migrate, especially if they're damp or wet. Um, can spread throughout the vehicle. Um, it's probably not a good idea because it would drain the battery. It's, it's a lot of people probably in the old days, if you can remember, you never set a battery on concrete because you come out in the morning, the earth will suck all the electrons out of it. <laughs> um, so it's kind of, so it's really not about grounding to earth in, a, in an automobile. It's about reducing static electricity on your body. That's one of the reasons why we know it. static electricity is, has profound effects on the body. Because when we grounded the truck drivers, <clears throat> you know, we were trying to measure um, pain and all that kind of stuff. And they came back and said they had significantly increased energy. And several of them said, hey, you had a significantly improved night vision. We didn't even ask the questions, but, they, but several of them in the study reported that. That's a big deal. So we know what static electricity does stress the body. It's, it's, elect, it's charged, positive charge. It's gonna pull on the free electrons, you know, pull them to the surface. It's going to affect you. You do not want anybody, anything affecting the negative electrons in your body. And static electricity would, is a, so did I answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this next question, and my apologies to Suzanne. Um, she was one of the first people to submit the question, but there was an issue with the formatting and I just fixed it. So my apologies, Suzanne, that we didn't ask your question right away. Um, she says, hello, good to be here. I find that when I sleep on top of the mat and pillow, I sweat a lot. I really enjoy my sleep uh, when they're covered with a sheet. Is that okay? Yeah, it's perfect to, um, to cover them with a the sheet. They're designed to be used that way. Um, people whose health is somewhat compromised, I highly recommend they sleep directly on it. But a lot of people are going to sweat and a lot of people don't sweat. But when you perspire, um, basically um, you're trapping heat and the body's trying to regulate its temperature. I mean, like if you have too many covers, then you're, you're gonna sweat more and the body has to push blood back and forth uh, to maintain the body temperature at a, where, where it wants it. So if you are sweating, oftentimes what sweating is, it's about um, releasing toxins or cleansing, whatever. But the pads themselves shouldn't make you sweat because heat rises uh, unless you're trapped under a lot of covers or something. Um, but after you spend enough time grounded, then all of a sudden you'll find that you don't sweat under any circumstance because the body is able to better regulate its body temperature and push blood flow around. But most of all, it's um, able to reduce the inflammation. And, and when you sweat, you're sweating things out of your body that your body doesn't want in your body. So there's other pieces, there's other sides to this than, than just body regulation and heat, but it's a cleansing process also. So when you have are grounded, you're reducing inflammation and you're releasing a lot of this other stuff. So go with it. 
All right, next question. Can you leave the patches on while sleeping? Yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Um, yes, highly recommend it. Especially if you're okay. over 70 years old. Once in a while, you, you go out and exercise too much. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Robin here. I just received my new socks. Thank you so much for restocking. Uh, would you have any suggestions for the most effective use of them? Currently, I stand on my universal mat all day while working and I sleep with another mat under my feet in bed. I thought the socks would give me additional options for grounding, hence the question. Thank you for all you do for us. Um, they're really great for sleeping. I mean, they're wonderful for sleeping. Um, <clears throat> it's like going outdoors and standing in the grass all night long. It's really going to have a, a profound effect on your body, significant effect. It's going to help normalize your, your, your system. Um, I would put them on and sleep with them. I would recommend. I've seen miracles. <laughs> Okay, um, Dave's question. I received my mat last week and I've been able to use it for about five to six hours a day. I'm wondering if you can give me a feel for how long it might take to see some relief from sciatica and back pain. Okay, <clears throat> um, I would sciatica and back pain. Um, there's a lot of stress going on here. Um, <clears throat> let me try to say this so it makes sense. You know, generally, if you have sciatica and chronic back pain and you weren't in an accident, you didn't fall off of a ladder, you didn't fall off a bicycle, you didn't get run over by a truck. Okay, so there's not injury here. <clears throat> what there is, is stress. Chronic, I mean, it's fight or flight that's releasing cortisol and also creating inflammation, but it's really causing the muscles to tight, tighten. And it can be protection, but stress is usually an indicator of being caught in a situation that you don't want to be in. You'd rather be doing something else. Uh, but if you're prolonged, then all of a sudden your muscles get tight, get protective, and then it can cause, you know, joints to move around and pinch nerves and sciatica is definitely a pinch nerve. And <clears throat> so um, I would say um, I would lay on the mat, back on the mat. I would try to figure out some meditation to go along with it at night, especially. Uh, do something to try to come to terms with the environmental stress that might be promoting this. The grounding is going to help with the inflammation. It's going to help release a lot of the tension in the body, but there's something feeding that tension. And you, you gotta think on that a little bit. And so either exercise, uh, diversion, um, meditation, great music, bottle of wine, <laughs> I'm going too far. <laughs> but anyhow, find th something to help take that, reduce that tension. Then your muscles can release and relax and the grounding will definitely help. But it, grounding can't, is not a do all. It is a, it's going to put you back in your natural state grounded. Uh, but beyond that, you still have a fight or flight system. You still have all these mechanisms. They're designed to work perfectly. And right now you're in a frozen fight or flight system. Uh, and again, this is observation from 25 years. So I'm speaking from experience of myself and other people. I've had sciatic when I was young. I've had back issues. I've had all kinds of things. I, fortunately, I'm 77. I don't have any of those right now. I'm really grateful. And I think it's because I walk, it's because I either, my own form of meditation, and that could be just listening to music I love, 
or it can be listening to um, Ellen Watts or somebody on you know, explain the universe to me every a hundred times over. And, but anyhow, so I do things at night to distract me and find another place, another space to come to terms with life. Yeah. Okay, uh, Lynn has terrible insomnia. Will earthing help me? Doesn't it emit EMFs? EMFs really affect me. No. <clears throat> uh, grounding products do not emit, emit EMF. That's a uh, misinformation that is distributed by the EMF people so they can sell their funny stuff. Um, <clears throat> the, when you are grounded to the earth, then your body is negatively charged. It's the only thing, I mean, and your body absorbs earth energy, earth's electric field and radiates, you know, earth energy and you know, from your body. So there's no EMF coming at you or, so <clears throat> what EMFs do, uh, based on all of my experience, I wanna make sure I answer this properly, but um, if you are sensitive to EMF, you said that EMFs bother me. And so, so if you are sensitive to EMF, then you have exhausted adrenals. You're, you have been in a stressed state or exposed to a lot of stress. It could be from work, money, family. It could be anything, bosses, customers, whatever. But anyhow, you're in, and, and what they've done, I mean, what's happened is, is every time you get stressed, then your fight or flight system really pushes cortisol into your body. That cortisol, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system tries to dampen that response to keep you level so that you can deal with things uh, consciously rather than run too fast or fight too fast. Uh, <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then you make your decision and you whatever. Uh, <clears throat> but if you live in a chronically elevated sympathetic state, meaning a lot of stress in your life, then eventually your adrenals, they only have, they have limited resources. They only have so much, so much hormones so they can secrete. But once that's worn out or exhausted, then they cannot protect you. Then all of a sudden, the, I mean, the um, parasympathetic is more, more sensitive. You can sense more things in your environment. People who have normal adrenals are not EMF sensitive. So that's why I can say this, because I know this and I've been doing it for 25 years. So, um, so the, the issue here isn't EMF. The issue is that you need to restore your adrenals. Um, and so what grounding will do for you is the first thing it will do, it will, it will calm the nervous system, provided this outside stress is not so powerful that it overwhelms your entire life chronically. But it'll calm the nervous system, quiet the nervous system, stop the cortisol. The adrenals can slowly recover over a period of time. Thyroid, all these things will recover over a period of time. It's just the immune system doing this normal thing. And um, um, yeah, that's what grounding does. Um, where do I go? Did I make sure I answer all the questions? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times people look at grounding and think it's going to be a cure all for everything. And, you know, I, like you just you said earlier, it's all grounding does is put you in your natural state. This is how we're supposed to be. Our bodies can then do their job to cure themselves and heal themselves. But, you know, if you're living a life where you're constantly stressed, it's like taking fish oil, right? Like it's not, it's going to help, but there's other lifestyle things that you need to do, you know? The main thing that grounding does is it puts out the fire in your body. It reduces all the inflammation. The word inflammation means inflame. Everybody has mm -hmm. it. And it's not normal to have inflammation in your body. Inflammation doesn't exist in the animals and people who live in the wild. It only exists in people and animals who live indoors. And that's because we're insulated from the earth. We've lost our ground. The problem with this is if you have inflammation in your body, then the immune system is not doing, not able to, your immune system is compromised because it can't do what it's supposed to do. 
because it's busy trying to put together or put out the damage, you know, repair the damage that's being created by a by a fire. I mean, an ongoing low burning, low smoldering fire. So that's why all of a sudden the immune system becomes so compromised, then inflammation sets in and then it manifests as, you know, cardiovascular disease or cancer or lupus or MS or Alzheimer's or endless. There's 85 of the popular ones uh, in Google that, you know, inflammation related health disorders, diabetes being one of the main ones, autism and so on. So <clears throat> anyhow, grounding is about your immune system, restoring and protecting your immune system. Uh, getting, being grounded is essential for your immune system to function optimally. So if you want to support your immune system, you're not going to find it in a bottle of pills. You're going to, you, you have to ground it because your immune system is electrical. It operates with reactive oxygen species, reactive meaning electrically charged molecules. So you have to, restore your ground in order to stabilize immune function and prevent the inflammation, then the immune system can restore and maintain health. And, at the, and, and that's all very straightforward. The problem that we all have problems with, all of us do, is the environmental stressors. You know, the things that go on in our lives that cause cortisol to pump, to pump mm -hmm. stress into our bodies. And those we have to work out individually. The grounded will help us. Okay, next question um, from Trisha. Have you done any studies with Dr. Tennant who works with the electric needs of the body? And or have there been any studies that measure the pH balance to determine if someone is grounded versus ungrounded? Yeah, when we first started, <clears throat> yeah, I know Jerry, I love this work. Um, <clears throat> when we first started, and I started investigating all this. Once I understood how the body worked, then you would normally do, you would normally be using the term pH, you know, the potential of hydrogen to reduce oxygen. And that's what react, that's what um, reaction and you know, redox potential. Uh, ground is, they're all the same terms. So <clears throat> the thing that we learned was that I, that I learned, but anyhow, I couldn't speak to people about pH because hardly anybody even knows what it is. The doctors don't measure pH. I mean, a few of the alternative docs do, but nobody uses that term or those terms. Um, <clears throat> but what I learned about pH was if you are grounded, then your pH will normalize. It has to, uh, but that's what it's all about. I mean, having enough um, alkaline, alkaline is more negative, meaning that's an electrical term, an electron term. So no more negative means more electrons available to reduce acid. You know, acid is positively charged. Okay, so the thing that, that is most interesting, I would love to have gone that route, but the problem is there's no way to really, it's very challenging to measure pH. Like, <clears throat> Um, there's a couple of instances I'd like to throw out here. One of them was though, I remember a lady in Utah and she was a very healthy person into health in love with grounding and all this kind of stuff. And she called me up one day and she, she said, you told me that grounding would reduce would normalize pH. And I said, it does, it has to, it can't, it can't not normalize pH. And so anyhow, she said, well, I take my pH every day and I'm still very acidic. And I didn't know what to tell her. And so it made me go question everything that I, that I was saying. But again, every time I would measure pH and whatever, I would see that it just, it's, it's math, it's, it's physics. Um, so anyhow, about six months later, I met her and she said, I finally got my divorce. And I says, what are you talking about? She says, yeah, when I met you, Guys, when we were doing whatever, she said, I was going through this horrendous divorce. And I said, well, and that's when you were telling me your pH wasn't in balance, right? Well, what it was, she was mentally stressed, pumping her body full of cortisol because of this event that was going on in her life. Mm -hmm. And that caused the pH to be off. 
And because now our pH is fine. So what I learned was, and, and verified this, that if you get stressed, your pH is going to instantly, your pH is going to be thrown off because your body's being pumped full of cortisol. So if you're stressed, absolutely, your cortisol is off. But if you get grounded, reduce the stress, then it'll balance out and normalize your pH. Um, but yeah, I wish more people knew about it, but they don't. But pH and what grounding, they're the same thing. Grounding is um, yeah, reducing. Yeah. All right. Ruthie's question, my house is not grounded. It was built in the 1930s and it's never been rewired. I have the ground rod outside and I'm running it in the bedroom. How frequently should I put water at the ground rod placement outside? I've been doing it every week or so. Is that enough? Uh, the, the rule is you want the ground to be uh, damp enough that normal vegetation would grow there. So grasses normally growing there, that's all you need or plants or so on. But if the ground gets dry and there's no moisture or you live in an arid climate, then what I would suggest is, you know, you're going to feel better when it's, when it's moist versus you're going to feel better when it's moist. You can actually feel the difference. Um, <clears throat> but what I would do is I would suggest getting a four foot um, radio, radio ground rod, radio antenna, antenna ground rod, uh, or a metal, you can buy them at Home Depot, I think, or order them there. Um, and then sink it into the ground a couple, three feet so that you're more, it's so that you're, in, so you're constantly in, in ground. Um, and it'll be more stable and it'll just work better. But yeah, you don't want to, I mean, it's, it's pain in the butt to go wadding our ground rot every <laughs> month. But I know that it works and it's essential until you get a permanent ground put in. And we do sell um, extension cords. I know a lot of people will run the ground rod over to where a place they know is water, maybe in grass or something that they know has a, a lot of water. Okay, um, if your hair is not very conductive, what is the value of a conductive pillow cover? Is there any special benefit to grounding the head that you don't see by grounding other parts of the body? Okay, first of all, <clears throat> your hair is not conductive. It's semi-conductive, meaning it has minerals and moistures in it, and electrons are going to migrate around. Further, uh, your body, your your face perspires probably more than anything in other parts of your body. So when you're laying on a pillow at night, you'll feel the dampness there when you move around. So you are grounded. Um, and again, if you have charge, you know, the brain uses a significant amount of energy. So there's a lot of electrical functioning going on in the brain at all times. And um, <clears throat> so what the pillow does, it does reduce inflammation, all that kind of stuff. It does help with the skin capillaries and the, um, you know, the oxygenation of the tissue. And you look 10 years younger after you sleep on it all night. But beyond that, <clears throat> here's the pillow and it's connected to the earth. And it's like so. And so it's sitting there singing and humming with the frequencies of the earth. So it's. And then when you lay on it, then your body close couples to it. So it's kind of like you're laying outdoors on the grass. And so it's more than just the electrons. It's this calming frequencies of the earth that and at night they're lower. So you sleep better during the day. They're higher. And you're more awake. And uh, so these, the amplitude of these frequencies, I think, help you sleep better. It's like in the cortisol study, if you were to look at the cortisol study at the Earthing Institute, you'll see that at midnight, you know, if the, I mean, and I always make the statement, you know, there's only one reason you don't sleep at night and don't sleep well. That's because you have elevated cortisol. Because if your cortisol is normal, then sleep is autonomic. It just happens like breathing um, <clears throat> because the body does these things in order to maintain. Um, 
So <clears throat> I'm sorry I lost it. I sidetracked myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. I was actually, give me one second. I was reading the next question. Ah, what, no. Well, we both got sidetracked at the same time. Well, it's about the conductivity of the pillow. And, and oh, yes, the advantage of using the pillow. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. But the advantages, are, the advantages are you sleep better. I mean, we know uh, in some of our early work, we were grounding school teachers who had compromised situations going on in their lives. And um, a group called Inspire, and we would give them bed pads, and they would get certain results, good results. And then later we gave them pillowcases because we met with them once a month for several months. And so on, and then all of a sudden they started coming back with big stories about the benefits of sleeping with the pillow. And they weren't just, uh, I mean, the skin is one of the issues. Uh, your hair is gonna grow better uh, because there's less inflammation. Hair loss is from inflammation. Um, you know, all kinds of good things, but it's really about meditating with the earth during sleep. All right. Now the next question, um, it's a bit long. I was <laughs> engrossed in it when you uh, asked me the, the last question. Okay. I know that you report that most everyone who grounds gets a clear clinical response. But could you give us a realistic percent of the time that people really do see a noticeable clinical response? So I kind of want to stop there because I don't know that we've ever said that every person receives a clear clinical response. Um, is it 100% of the people or is it lower? And if it's lower, what would explain why some people aren't getting such a good response? And this person goes on to talk about how they've been grounding and um, sleeping grounding, but they're not seeing any improvement in plantar fasciitis, ankle osteoarthritis, or measurable sleep differences? Okay. Well, first of all, we know. For him and his wife. It's him and his wife have been experimenting with grounding. Okay. So <clears throat> let's break it up a little bit. So first of all, if somebody gets grounded, hard grounded, meaning put a patch on or sleep directly on the uni mat. I mean, the, not the uni mat, but the, the mattress cover mm -hmm. or the mattress cover and the pillowcase. We know that <clears throat> instantly there's going to be a release of tension in the body. Within 15 minutes, we know that the blood is going to be, um, it's not going to be uh, thick and sticky. It's going to the blood is, we're going to increase the negative surface charge on the red blood cells, and then the red blood cells repel each other, and then the blood thins, and it can get in and out of the capillaries and oxygenate the tissue. Anybody who's grounded can go look in the mirror 15 before and 15 minutes later, and they'll notice the, the color, the change in their, in, their, in their skin color. So that's what, and that's improved oxygenation of the tissue and reduction of inflammation because the blood can now get into the capillaries and uh, properly oxygenate the tissue. So we know without a doubt that, that happens. Uh, the other things that happen is uh, we know that the brain waves, uh, as soon as you ground the body, you know, the alpha, delta, theta, and beta. So what will happen is before they're tight like so, and then afterwards the, 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 the waves increase in size. So what that means is we reduced the tension and now uh, everything can move. Uh, there's more um, variability. We also know that the heart rate variability, the heart, instead of being tight like this, then all of a sudden, as soon as it gets grounded, then there's the, the, the ability of your heart to move and, and um, I mean, to respond to getting up from a chair or doing this or whatever it's loose and free and it can function more freely. Uh, where if you're not grounded, it's tight and tense. Um, <clears throat> we also know that, uh, well, for instance, like the trapezius muscles, when you, you measure those, you put an electrode here, an electrode here, and you're using biofeedback equipment. So here you are 
very tight tension lines, and then instantly, instantly upon grounding, then all of a sudden you see these big shifts and then the muscles are starting to make, uh, you know, increase in variability, meaning they have, now you have better range of motion, better extension and all these things. So, and I can go on with the studies. It's like your blood sugar is going to normalize overnight. We know all these things. You can go to the Earthing Institute. There's at least 25 peer reviewed published studies there that touch on everything. Uh, and that gives you a, you know, taken together, it kind of helps you understand and recognize what grounding, you know, the impact that it has on the body. But most of all, it prevents inflammation. So if you're hard grounded to the earth, you can't have inflammation in your body. And if you don't have inflammation in your body, then the immune system can recover and start going back and start to repair the damage that has been done <clears throat> over the days, hours, weeks, or years. Mm -hmm. And the longer <laughs> you've had these problems and the older you are and the more wear and tear, the longer it may take to recover. But <clears throat> as long as you keep the inflammation down and keep the fire out, your body will recover and it will return to normal. We know this, we've seen it. So now let's move on. Uh, everybody, we can say that that's 100%. That's because it's a human body on planet Earth. And, and you know, and everything, I mean, and that's just the way it is. It's like a grasshopper is a grasshopper is a grasshopper. You know, as long as you are living on the Earth and connected to the Earth and you're grounded, then you are a grounded mammal just like all the mammals who live in the wild. No cancer, no cardiovascular disease, no diabetes, no nothing. Just health. They have health. Okay, next part. Okay. Um, they have been using the bed pad and grounding mats as much as they can. He's guessing about 16 plus hours a day, as well as walking outside. Um, He's wondering if his ground, the ground in his home could be bad. He's also not using the patches, but connecting a ground wire to a silver 10 sleeve. Okay. So I think this person is really looking for, um, is wondering, and we get this question a lot, you know, I've been using your product for a few months. Why isn't this fixed? Why isn't that fixed? Why isn't this cured? And um, right. I think that's kind of the essence of their question. Okay, so, so the first thing that I would ask is, and again, it's hard to have these conversations in these kind of mm -hmm. podcasts, um, is have you received any benefit whatsoever? Have you had any reduction of pain whatsoever? Uh, if they have, then the ground is probably working. If they've had no reduction in pain, uh, no increase in energy, no improvement whatsoever, then I would say there's probably, uh, I would test the grounding products. I don't know whether they're ours or somebody else's, but they need to be tested. Uh, test the grounding wires to make sure that they are functional. A lot of those ground wires that come on the market, they don't last very long or they, some, you know, a high percentage of them don't even work. Um, but test the wires, test the ground pads, uh, test the outlet ground. And that alone should suggest that the products are working. Then <clears throat> if you're sleeping in a lot of clothing at night, heavy pajamas, that might be an issue. If you have uh, flannel sheets or things like that, that could be impeding you know, impede the grounding a little bit. But I would experiment with sleeping directly on the mat, bare skin. But I would highly suggest uh, taking the patch, if you have one, uh, the conductive sleeve that he's talking about, the TENS unit sleeve, um, those have silver in them and they do wear out. Uh, silver oxidizes, that's why we don't sell silver products anymore. But the silver, except for, I mean, we do, but we don't like to because the sock is, has silver in it, but we increase that to 20%. But <clears throat> anyhow, but the silver won't last as long. Um, but again, you can test it and find out. But if it's making pain go away, then it's probably working. Um, 
but you gotta test, test, test this stuff because this is electrical stuff. And I know a lot of stuff is sold out there without meters and without testers and stuff. And it's really a shame because we made this simple tester that had the green light so you could test the cores, test the products. And we have the outlet checkers. But you know, somebody's got to do their, just, you know, make sure that things are working. Um, a tester would be, I think they're going on sale or something this week for 20 bucks or something. But I would get one of those for sure and play with that. Um, but again, I don't know the age, don't know the condition, don't know the history. <clears throat> but was what was the mention? Was there any mention of osteoarthritis or things like osteoarthritis, that? Osteoarthritis, plantar fasciitis. Okay, plantar, plantar fasciitis has been cured in days, in just a few days with patches, all too many times. Uh, so we know that the patches work great for that. Their socks would also be helpful there. But again, if you have plant, uh, if you have plantar fasciitis, you have inflammation in your body. Your body is full of inflammation. Um, and I know this because, again, my 25 years of experience in working with people. And I remember one gentleman that I grounded one time, uh, he almost lost his vision and everything else. He had plantar fascia. So we grounded him for like a week, two weeks, completely went away. His vision came back, all these things. Uh, that was Randy, if you remember. He's one of, one of the early people who was with us. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so, so anyhow, here's what I, there's, there's a twofold problem here. First of all, you gotta make sure all your grounding equipment's working good. And then the patch is always the best test for your everything. If you put a patch on and, and the pain goes away within five minutes, that means your wires grounding are working and it means your earth ground is working. Um, <clears throat> so that's always the best one. But even this um, tangent sleeve that he's, that he's wearing um, should be the same thing. Uh, it should be able to reduce the inflammation in five, 10 minutes. Or reduce the pain, You're reducing the pain, and it may explain, if you have pain, then you have inflammation. You cannot have pain unless you have inflammation. So if the, if the pain is coming down, that means grounding is coming up and in in reducing the inflammation. That means grounding is working. But if you have massive amounts of inflammation in your body, and when I say massive, it's not, you have a lot of inflammation in your body. Then <clears throat> when you ground the body, it's got a lot of work to do. And it doesn't instantly, it will over, it will put pain, take pain away in a minute or two with patches and so on. But globally, the body as a whole, it may take longer times and more grounding and more time grounded than not grounded. And then you have to draw the line and say, okay, if this is doing this, it's doing what it's supposed to. Then you have to go to the other side and say, what's feeding the inflammation of my body? What's causing all of this inflammation? It's something you're eating, thinking, drinking, uh, social pressure, social, I mean, financial. It's, there are, I call them coyotes out there. There's um, things that are driving the fight or flight or stressing the body sufficient that the immune system is too busy trying to deal with this inflammation. Can't take care of the inflammation. So the grounding is gonna help. It's, grounding alone is not a cure-all. It is a support mechanism. It will, once you put the fire, it's gonna put the fire out, but what's feeding that fire you gotta, you gotta get your mind around and, and try to work with it and try to identify it. But I would say experiment, experiment, experiment. Talk to our customer service, find out you know, how to get you a meter or whatever, or how to test your products and make sure they're working. And then just learn, um, learn what works and then do more of it. And then again, if your health is very compromised, then stay grounded more than not grounded until you can give your chance to recover here your immune system a chance to recover. So every night it's got more power, more energy to go for and try to do whatever it can between the periods that you're grounded and not. Very good. And uh, interestingly, we have a success uh, 
story by Mariel, who uh, submitted this here. It's not a question, but Mariel says, I've put the mat around my head to improve my blurry vision and it sharpens it while I have it on. I told my friend with macular degeneration and he is seeing things now um, like silhouettes and more light and clarity. So you mentioned vision a couple minutes ago. I thought that was I've pretty been, interesting. I've had John and get some patches and get, and get, and get his sight back. Yeah. Okay, well, I think um, that's about all the questions we have time for today. Um, I encourage you to log in and get your questions in early. I do try to go in the order that they were received. Um, a lot of our, um, the questions that I do see that tend to pop up are addressed in our FAQ section on our website, earthing.com. You can also always reach out to our customer service department, help at earthing.com. Um, another great resource is the earthinginstitute.net. Uh, make sure that you visit our website at earthing.com as we currently have a sale going on and we'll have uh, multiple sales going on, you know, through the holidays. We're getting ready for um, all that shopping <laughs> for the holidays. Uh, so if you visit our site, earthing.com, uh, you can save up to 50% off on some items while supplies last. If you haven't done so already, I um, highly recommend that you follow us on social media as well as subscribe to our newsletter and make sure uh, that you're in the loop regarding our upcoming webinars, sales, and uh, new product announcements. If you are a member of our, um, if you have subscribed to our newsletter, then you already know about the sale we have going on. It started a few days ago. Also be sure to check out our Earthing YouTube channel and subscribe. You'll be able to watch the Earthing movie and watch all these webinars. Well, thank you to my customer service team and thank you to everyone for submitting questions. And thank you, Clint. Thank you. See you next week. Yeah. Have a good night. It's fun. Bye.